We're here. We made it. We're at Friends of Scales Reptile Rescue. You said it right. I am awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> this is Erica McVeigh. Way better than Ryan McVeigh. Obvious. <laughs> Thank you. And we're here checking out the rescue. So we're going to show you how things are working here and how you can probably help, mm -hmm. hopefully. And so stay tuned. And. So we're headed back, uh, tried to do Tinley, didn't work out, but we ended up uh, squeezing in a whole bunch of other cool things. Um, you know, it's pretty empty with the whole uh, epidemic that's going on. <laughs> but uh, John, what do you think? Worth the trip? It was it was cool. Tinley was a bust. That sucked. Uh, I tried to do the Tinley Underground. There wasn't much going on there either. Um, the Reptarium was cool in Detroit. Went to check that out. First time I've ever been there. Um, Behind the scenes at Zilla. Zilla was definitely cool. The Borneo Earless Monitor. Yeah, man. Uh, Ryan's house was awesome. Yeah. The, the, the dwarf African crocodile. I don't Absolutely. think I'd ever see one of those. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, it was a good trip. It was obviously disappointing because Tinley didn't work out, but it is what it is. October bound. So uh, make sure you go check out also Forest Fanning's benefit auction is happening right now on the Mass, Herp the Mass Herpetological Society <laughs> auction page. Madison Area Herpetological Society. The, the MAHS. MAHS. <laughs> the, the MAHS auction page. Uh, there's a whole bunch of cool stuff up right now, so go check it out and uh, bid uh, stupid. Bid real stupid. How do you come by getting all these rescue animals? So a lot of them do come from personal owners. So personal owners, Jesus. They come from private homes that people couldn't take care of them. A lot of them actually come from people who unfortunately bought them for their kid when they were younger mm -hmm. and then the kid went to college and it's usually like mom or dad who are like, no, we're not taking care yeah. of this anymore or we don't like crickets or we don't like the mice and they don't want to take care of it anymore. Um, and that's fine. And we take those animals in and then we rehabilitate them because sometimes they're a little bit on the thinner side um, mm. especially with animals where they didn't like the feeder we have to right. usually put weight back on them and then we find them new homes which is not a problem so much we do take in some abuse cases it's not as common as you would think so a big okay. misconception is that there's so many abuse cases um, and it's just not ha it's not true there's there are don't get me wrong right but that's not the main reason that we get animals in. Most of them actually just come in because people just can't take care of them anymore and they don't know where to go. Or a lot of it is, this is a really old animal. We've had it for 20 years. We'd like to move on with our lives or we didn't think we would have it for 20 years. Yeah. And then some of it is geriatrics. Um, they're going into assisted living facilities or they're moving to Florida, right. they're moving to Arizona or they're moving into just smaller homes in general and they can't take care of these animals anymore. That tends to happen more and more with um, tortoises actually. We're seeing that happen yeah. a lot where they thought, oh my grandkids will take it or oh like right. my son loved it when he was younger and he'll take care of it and then the son gets and he's like, no, I don't want it. Yeah. And so we get a lot of those animals in too. So a lot of inheritance animals. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize uh, you kind of need like uh, a will with, oh, this animal's going to live for 130 years. Uh, yes. I didn't think about that when I bought it in my 20s. And now... <laughs> well, not only do you need a will, but you actually... So here's the problem. You need a will, but you also need somebody who wants the animal yeah. at the end of the will. Yeah. That's the big problem, is that a lot of people will put them into the will mm. and be like... Tommy will love it forever. And then Tommy gets in and goes, no, I hate snakes. And yeah. then we get a snake in. Or they don't like tortoises or they just don't have room for it because they live in like a studio apartment and then right. they're bequeathed, you know, a salcata. And where are they going to do it? That? <laughs> like right. it's not going to work out. We do also work with, we had talked about off camera before, the Herb Society, the mm. Madison Area Herb Society. We work a lot with them, all three of the branches. We... Um, they do have their own rescue that they do. Um, it's not an official rescue. It's just they'll take animals in. Right. 
and then we are their official rescue partner. So we've taken a lot of the animals that are super common a lot of times, like their ball pythons, their bearded dragons. After they've had them for so long, and nobody in the herb society is necessarily going to adopt them because they're more of like the advanced hobbyists, the people who really like what you know is right. in the reptile industry, and they want to get to the more advanced and exciting, like the sexier animals. Yeah. They're like, we don't want another ball python. So then the ball pythons come to us. And we find homes with families who are super excited because a ball python is like super exotic for right. them mm -hmm. and they can't wait. So that's where our role is for that too. Well, that's awesome because these animals do need somebody to take care of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always important that we have people willing to step in when there's an emergency like that so that these animals, they're, they're important to me, they're important to you. They need somebody that cares about them and take care of them. I'm glad to hear that you're doing this, but also this seems like it could cost a lot of money. How do you go about funding and taking care of all these animals that aren't yours and you're just like, hey, come here, I'll take care of you. <laughs> so, um, it was, so, not gonna lie, and this is, you know, one of those things that I don't talk about often, although I've been told that we should talk about more often, was in the beginning, I actually funded most of this personally. So we've wow. been around for almost 10 years now. We're just on, we're just shy of 10 years. And I funded most of it personally out of my own, you know, bank account for a really long right. time. I was working as a veterinary technician. Anybody who knows what a veterinary technician makes, I was doing really well for a veterinary technician, living on my own, but supporting a rescue, eh, not so much. Yeah. Um, so it was a very difficult time. Fortunately, as a 501c3, we were able to fundraise. And one of the things that I learned was that people, if you reach out to them and say, hey, this is what we do, this is you know, our job, our mission, this is our goal in life, they're happy to help you and people will actually find you because they want to help you. Mm -hmm. If you go out there and say, hey, I need to raise X amount of money for X amount of things, it doesn't work. Right. Uh, which is why we always did so well with fundraising and why we haven't really had as many problems with raising funds because we raise what we need. Um, but it's more passive, it's people want to support us and right. they give what we need and we tell them, hey, this is what we need it for. We need it for animal care. We need it to do a little bit of the outreach, but we're not paying, you know, I am the executive director, but I'm voluntary. Like right. I'm not being paid for it. None of our board members are being paid for it. So it's a labor of love, yeah. Exactly, so it's mainly out of just donations from people who found us and loved our mission. Uh, we did get our first official grant this year from oh, wow. Congratulations. Uh, a private donor, which was like the coolest thing ever. I'm like, I made the big time. <laughs> um, so I was really, really excited about that. And then we've had um, charities raise funds for us before because they believed in us mm -hmm. and they found us. We didn't reach out to them, they found us. So um, organically, it seemed that we've been able to raise these funds because people find us and just believe in what we do. Awesome. Can we see some of the animals you might have available? Absolutely. Uh, might need um, a, a home. <laughs> so a lot of these animals here are in, they're in quarantine. So I always like to preface it that first, that these are not the ideal setups. These are not like what they should go home in or anything like that. Right. These are just the quarantine ones. These are what we keep in, you know, just bare and sparse because we need something that's easy to clean, that's easy to disinfect at the end of the day. Right. So that when we do get different animals in, we can just wipe it out, we can disinfect it, let it sit out for the day, and then put a new animal in. Otherwise, it doesn't really work out so well for us. Right. Um, these animals are also waiting for foster homes, so we do have a whole bunch of fosters, so I need oh, to cool. say all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to. Gotcha. Um, some of the animals that we have are like this bearded dragon. Hi, sweet pea. Come here. I know. And this is Anna. Anna. She's and she is a sweetie. Um, she came in and she was a little pistol. Holy cow, is she a pistol? Yeah. Um, but since then, she's been we've been working with her, and she's actually gotten significantly better with being handled and just understanding that people aren't scary. And part of our foster program is we do like to find fosters that are willing to work with animals that are aggressive. Right. We absolutely love people who want to work with animals that are slightly more aggressive and help them to learn, like hands are not scary yep. like people are not scary and sometimes that is just putting them in an enclosure and then putting them in like a higher foot traffic area in your house and letting them get used to just seeing people all the time just yep. desensitizing them 
um, her, she needed just a little bit of love. She needed to learn that food comes from hands, that, you know, care comes from hands, that you're not going to get flicked anymore, you're not going to have horrible things happen to you. So, right. yeah, you can side eye me all you want. It's a true story. We needed to do that, and then we also just needed to get some weight on her. So that was kind of her big goal, but now she's stable enough where we can put her into a foster home. A lot of our fosters, You hear though, that? You're stable. Yeah, she is stable. <laughs> Mentally, she should be, but um, we actually put a lot of our animals into foster homes that have children. Okay. And it's the reason behind it is when I started Friends of Scales, I wanted to create um, a way that really puts emphasis on responsible keeping. Right. Like, I am, I never damn the herp, the reptile community, like, at all. I don't have a problem with breeding. I don't have a problem with responsible breeding. It's, but I wanted people to know that, like, responsible keeping is an option. And part of that is that these animals, there's no, like, rent an animal to find out if it works for you. Yeah. And so you can do all the research in the world on a bearded dragon, and, all, and these kids do. Like, we get kids all the time who do, like, piles of paperwork and they'll like do presentations we had kids who do powerpoint presentations on bearded mm -hmm. dragons and then they find out they cannot handle the idea of a cricket like they actually get to see a cricket and they're like nope yeah they can't do it or they can't handle the bearded dragon poop or they can't handle the nails but there's something that they can't handle with it or the texture thing and we need you know they would be stuck with it if they bought it mm -hmm. and you can't do anything about it yeah. So instead, we started the foster program with the idea that if it doesn't work out and your beard dragons don't work out in your home, groovy. Tell me, I'll give you a leopard gecko. Try a leopard gecko. See if maybe smaller, drier poops work out better for mm -hmm. you. Or if that texture of that skin works out better. That doesn't work? Okay, let's try a skink where you don't necessarily need to do crickets. Yeah. Or let's try like a crested gecko where you can try something that's more like, um, like a crested gecko diet. And so that was like a big thing for us was trying to help families find the proper animals so that we could really, really promote that responsible pet keeping. That's awesome. Yep. So this guy is going to be going hopefully to somebody um, soon. There you go. Nice guy. And we have cute butts. You're so cute. Hello. I mean, come on. Look at the cutest butts. That's a tush right there you can love. Right? <laughs> I wonder they keep saying there that in the go, comments. Man. <laughs> Dubia roaches, orange, what is it, the orange head spotted roaches, crickets, that's what we feed. We don't do mealworms. Mm -hmm. um, but no, they go absolutely nuts and we get them nice and chunky and fat again and we get them adopted out. Why don't you feed mealworms? Why don't we feed them, huh? Because they make my eye twitch. Because <laughs> how about the real answer? <laughs> Educate the masses, honey. So. Personally, I don't enjoy. I don't feed mealworms because they do have um, a super high fat, but they have a lot of fat swap. Okay. Um, they also have a lot of chitin in them, and then they also have a lot of phosphorus in them, which almost all the feeder insects have an inverse ratio of calcium to phosphorus. That's just how that goes. Um, earthworms and snails are one of the very few that don't. Mm -hmm. So earthworms and snails actually have a um, normal or a favorable calcium to phosphorus ratio and that's just because of the dirt they eat so they're able to get that calcium in them mm -hmm. mealworms don't so there are a lot of phosphorus there are a lot of fat and so it's just like feeding them like bonbons all day or like cheesy poofs like you're not mm -hmm. really giving them anything that's nutritionally valuable to them and then if you're not giving an animal you know anything that like enough water or you're not keeping them hydrated enough you're also running into animals who are becoming like impacted sometimes um, and I hate to say that word and so I'm like really hesitant to say it because like they're not truly impacted uh, but they become constipated uh, mm -hmm. or they come into susceptible with it like they have problems with these issues with them um, that's not the word I wanted with the deceptive but either way so but they have these bowel problems with it because sometimes they don't chew them up and so like it's like one crunch and then they can't digest anything and you'll just get like these poops that come out and it's like all this like casing of mealworm pieces which is mm -hmm. ridiculous or people feed them like superworms or king worms and they are not meant to eat that and so they can't crunch through it so they're really not getting the nutrition out of it right. and then they're trying to pass the whole head through or they're trying to pass out entire you know pieces through their intestines that don't break down and their heart so they don't bend in the intestines and it can cause a lot of problems so long story short we don't feed it because we found that crickets are easier to manage and 
the roaches it's, were actually pretty high in proteins. It's awesome that you're so knowledgeable about all this because part of the problem with, and, and especially with the rescue animals, is people don't have the education about these animals. Mm -hmm. They go into a pet smart, they have somebody that gives them a pamphlet and tells them something that they heard from somebody else is not quite right, and they run into problems. And the first thing they do is, oh, my, my pet is looking a little sick. I don't know what to do about it. Uh, take it. I don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's weird because and it's a little hypocritical because like when we keep them um, in the quarantine here, they're just in the racks so that we can monitor them. Like I can see exactly how much they're eating, what they're pooping, and then when we give them to the fosters, we can say, listen, you know, this is an animal that has problems eating this insect or it has mm -hmm. problems with this defecation. Um, but our fosters are the ones that tell us like the preferences and the personalities and stuff like that. When we have them in foster care, we tell them we want them with UVB light. We want them to have daylight and things like that. So like this is just temporary, but when we have the fosters, we want them to set them up with the best care possible with that UVB and stuff like that, which is something that unfortunately you don't necessarily learn about when you're you know, going to pet stores, and I'm not hating on pet stores by any stretch. Mm -hmm. um, it's unfortunately just, it's like you said, it's some ignorance to it because they're only, they only know what they're taught. And some of it is passed down from corporate and that's what corporate allows them to say because mm -hmm. somewhere down the line in 1970, that's what their corporate vet told them that they were allowed to say. Yeah. And then it hasn't changed since then. And that's kind of a problem that we have. Yeah, I don't want to make it sound like I'm bashing on those people either because I'm sure it's coming from the best intentions, but... Oh, absolutely. You know. And to be honest, some of my best fosters and adopters truly are people who work at PetSmart, Petco, you know, other mm -hmm. pet stores and things like that, who, you know, they realized that the animals that they were taking care of in the pet stores or that the animals that they were, you know, adopting from the pet stores weren't getting the best care that maybe they could have been providing. And mm -hmm. so they were researching, they were reaching out, and they were looking into it further. And then they realized that there was another option and then they found us when they were researching or they found us to ask us a question and we were able to connect with them and then give these animals great, better homes. That's awesome. And then like we're vomiting a whole bunch of knowledge on them because <laughs> half the fosters that come in come in for like 10 minutes or like 10 minute appointments and then don't leave for like an hour mm -hmm. because we're too busy word vomiting and you know sharing stories and knowledge. That's great. Yep, that's Aladdin. Aladdin. My little nugget. Come on, buddy. He knew I love him so much. But we have um, tortoises that are up for adoption. We do have some adopt. We uh, well, they will be up for adoption soon. But we have um, some ambassador animals. Who he is hiding all the way down the corner because he's just done with y'all. Oh, I see ya. Yeah, apparently he's just he is not. You take that back. He's up for adoption, you said? No, he is not. <laughs> I don't care what Ryan tells you, he is That's not. Better. So that is a rhinoceros iguana. Yes. Are you sure? Super sweet. You didn't sound very confident. Sometimes I like to make sure that I pronounce things correctly. It's very good. It's written right here. And not for adoption. In the <laughs> zoom ad page, because Zilla didn't make anything for this. What? Brown <laughs> <laughs> daggers. Oh yeah, and then here is, so this guy came in. Oh, look at this beauty. So the huntsman came in as a super cranky corn snake. And oh my gosh, he's so cranky and you can't hold him. And he just doesn't like anybody. Super chill, super chill, super sweet. You're so nice, like, look at you. Super nice guy. Um, we actually had another one that looked very similar to this come in that also came in super sweet. And then like, let me tell you, that's really confusing when you have one that's super sweet and one that's like supposed to be not super sweet. Mm -hmm. Like that gets really confusing. <laughs> But no, Huntsman is like super nice. And once you get over the initial, like having to do the colubrid walk mm -hmm. for a little bit, yep. does wonderful and you can hang out with them and he'll like chill on your arm. Um, but that's another case I think of just ignorance um, and not, I shouldn't say ignorance because that always has like such a negative connotation yeah. of like, oh, you're ignorant. Yeah, and that's right. not the case. Um, Sorry, just I had to go of, for the South Park reference. But. Just lack of knowledge, that's Exactly, all. Yeah. and being told that if a snake is flighty and like super quick, that it's gonna bite you. And it's true for some snakes, mm -hmm. but not all snakes. Like the huntsman, his first initial instinct is run. And then you pick him up and he's like, oh, okay, okay. 
we're good. And then he's good and he's relaxed and he enjoys being out and he enjoys exploring. Um, so he'd be great for like a family that has kids and we're super excited that there's some fosters who are like really like gun ho for him and setting up yeah. enclosures. And we have now a list of fosters who want more information. At, we have more people who want more information on being a foster because they get to see animals like this on our social media or they get to see animals like this at some of our outreach events and like how cool he is. That's awesome. I know, I've been kind of like tempted to be like, I want to adopt you and just <laughs> love you forever and you can just stay with me. So if people are interested in getting involved in maybe being a foster or adopting an animal from you, how can they get in touch with you? So you can actually find us really easy. You can even just Google Friends Scouts um, and we show up everywhere on that. Or you can go to our website and then we also have a Facebook page and an Instagram page, believe it or not. The link will be in below. The link will be in the description. Best oh, I'm like... Best point to the bed. ground, I'm mouthing something to me, I'm like... I know, I'm like, do we need a bed? Or <laughs> <laughs> what's the issue? <laughs> <laughs> and through those same places, they can donate to the, the shelter? Absolutely. So on our uh, website, which actually is going to be updated, and I know we keep saying it's going to be updated, but it really will be updated, I promise. Um, there is a link that goes right to our PayPal right okay. now and then we are looking at trying to get a store up and open with some of that too um, so that you guys can buy like t-shirts and you can buy you know the stickers that we have okay, so cool. things like that that will be available awesome. um, but I think on Facebook there is like the donate now button and that actually does go through um, network for good and so oh, network for, for good does take a little bit out of it but it's the same thing as like a PayPal does it. So, awesome. so the adoption fees are usually about $30 um, for corn snakes, but like ball pythons are usually anywhere between like 10 and 30. Um, we were adopting um, more ball pythons that had numerous genes to them at like $30. We had um, red tail boas are usually adopted out at like $10 because we have so many that come into the rescue. Mm -hmm. Uh, but nothing is usually ever over like a $75 adoption and wow. that's usually like our large sulcatas and things like that and that's because usually I have to meet you somewhere and it's a giant pain in my butt but <laughs> you know it's usually between 10 and 45 I want to say is our adoption rate. very reasonable um, and Costs then way more to take care of these things while you're uh, bringing them back to health absolutely and so part of it was a lot of rescues, and this is true of like dog and cats and stuff like that, they, char they charge more for the adoption. And I understand why, because there's so much that goes into it, you know, getting the animals healthy and, you know, goes into maintaining these animals and things like that. So I completely understand why. And so they'll put um, like a larger, or they do like the fair market price and stuff like that. And like, I'm talking like dogs and bird rescues and things like that, mm -hmm. which is totally fair because they want... They don't want people flipping them. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that too in like different reptile rescues across the nation and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with it. We wanted to keep it lower because we didn't want families to be priced out of the game. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that they had the ability to adopt the animal that they fell in love with when they fostered. That they had the ability, you know, to come in and get that first pet. But they had the money left over to buy the big enclosure, to buy mm. the lights that we tell them, because you have to prove to us that you have the enclosure and the whole setup beforehand. Oh, if I have a $250 adoption fee, you might not get the best enclosure. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure that you have everything in the best interest of the animal set up first before we adopt out to you, you know, and then we'll adopt at a lower fee because I don't think if you're doing adoptions that you should have to pay a super high fee. Um, our relinquishers though do pay a uh, $50 fee to relinquish to us. Okay. Um, and that is to cover for some of the maintenance costs and things like that. And that's what we tell them is that this is, you know, given to the rescue as a way to support the rescue and to support the animal that you're giving us because you are giving us your pets. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure that we're able to maintain it. And we think that's fair. And we do tell them how it works with the adoption. But for the most part, people are happy to do it. And actually our biggest donors are relinquishers, believe it or not, because we make it such an easy process for them and we make it so guilt-free for them. Mm -hmm. um, and we prove that we do put their animals first and their animals care first 
that they usually give more than the $50. And so we have some that give like a couple hundred dollars or something like that. And it's not expected, but it's always appreciated. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. So I want to thank you for letting us come in here and check this out. Absolutely. Also get the information out to the people around here because you're doing a great thing for these animals. Thank you very much. I really enjoy what we do. So we want to thank Erica and Ryan for having us over and showing us around the rescue. Um, if you're in the Chicago area or in the Midwest, they would love to hear from you if you're looking to get involved in uh, some fostering or rescues. And also, we're going to put the links down in the description if you want to donate to them. They're trying to do a lot of good for these animals and it would be really helpful. And uh, thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, give us a thumbs up. If you didn't, feel bad <laughs> if you haven't subscribed subscribe because we love you guys and uh herman here says give me money That's bye <laughs>all right so we're really happy to be here it was so nice for you to invite us to actually do this uh we heard we're the second people to actually be here but the first actually that are welcome <laughs> <laughs> this video was brought to you by dave kaufman's reptile adventures rattle on <laughs> oh my God. love you dave <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is your deal you have to be in, gonna be in the intro you're in the intro are we on oh well, you're on are you really close in on my face? Not yet. I feel like you're really close in on me. No, I'm in the right perspective. I think you're always like, let me show you your crotches. <laughs> <laughs> there was one video. We were at, we were at, when there you we go, at, that should be an Instagram poll. Who's crotches are cuter? When we were at, <laughs> woo, we were at uh, Justin Kabelka's and there, there was like five minutes of Ryan looking around because he was like looking at oh. stuff. And, <laughs> and I'm like, dude, what were you filming? And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you're just filming crotches. Lots and lots of like crotches. like five minutes of Justin's crotch. Right, yes. Did you watch Bob's Burgers? I did. Yeah. So you're kind of like Gene in this regard. Yes. <laughs> nice. Okay. I knew I liked you. I can, I can pull through on this one. This is going to be good. All right. I know people are concerned. Oh, so an adoption fee for these guys is usually around... <laughs> See, I didn't catch up on the bed part. What? I need to... <laughs> what? There's a whole bunch of cool stuff up right now, so go check it out and uh, bid... Uh, stupid. Week. Bid real stupid. Open till next Saturday. If we uh, if we don't catch you, I don't know what I'm saying right now. A little hot in here. <laughs> Are you uh, sick? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't say that. <laughs> Um, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, we're going to see you next time.